Father, we bless your name and we glorify you because of your word which is so real and so full. We thank you because every time we come together to study your word, you bless us in very personal ways. And Father, we're asking that tonight as we come before the Holy Rich, the Holy Scriptures, that will open our understanding again in Jesus' name, and your word will enrich our lives, and you'll help us to be better in your service in Jesus' name. Thank you because of what we know you are going to do. Glorify yourself in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. We have been coming before the word of the Lord every Monday, and it's been an enriching study indeed as we've gone, as we've gone into the expository systematic study of Acts of the Apostles. Now, you remember that last week we were in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, and I talked to you on basic biblical church organization. And I showed you that whenever you are following biblical organization in the church, the church will grow. And the church will grow in various ways. Spiritual growth will come. Numerical growth will come, material growth will come, as well as social growth. And I told you last week the reason for the growth. And I told you also the requirements they were looking for in the workers they were choosing. You saw the roast and you saw the result. Now, we want to pick up just one of those people on our roster last week. In fact, the very first person among them, you know, seven people had been chosen to take care of the distribution of material needs to the believers in the early church. And the very first one of those seven people is Stephen. I will want to see very closely the life of that individual, Stephen. He had the regular responsibility. Now we cannot tell whether he was the leader of the seven, whether he was supposed to just coordinate the whole distribution of material food, uh, we don't know. All we know is that among all the seven, he was chosen as first. And uh, he, he tops the least. And we're told about his life in the verse following uh, what we read last week. Now, let's see in Acts chapter 6, reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to receive the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then the servant men, that means the hired men, which said, We have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And he stirred up and he stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law for we have heard him say that Je this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel now in a church, and uh, I've been in a church for a long time, because I've got saved a number of years ago, and um, I've been an ordinary member in the church, I've been, uh, you know, just uh, among those who studied uh, music in the rudimentary stage, I've been among the people watching over the toilet in a church, I've been among the people doing the physical work in the church, I've been among the people answering questions or just reciting memory verse in the church, in a, uh, we call it Sunday school, what we call Sunday scripture now, I've been just uh, somebody that once, uh, once in a long time will stand up and give a short testimony and you know I've mixed with many many people in the church and you know what I find in the church many people in the church depend on the name the title the position you give them in the church before they did something and I find that as I read it today in Acts chapter 6 
Do you know that your usefulness to God in the church or in the world does not depend on whether you are called brother or reverend? Whether you are called a servant or a bishop, your usefulness in the church does not depend on the title that you are called with. You know, Stephen was not an apostle. Stephen was just an individual chosen uh, to take care of ordinary material things in the church. But do you know, his usefulness in the church was not limited by the position he held. And I have found many people in the church. Of course, uh, you know, I was also like that with a number of our church members. You know, we will say, you know, if the a pastor or the overseer can just promote us and he can just realize that we ought to be in a particular place, if they give us a greater position in the church, we'll be able to be more useful. But I find as I read my Bible that your usefulness depends on your faithfulness where you are. It's not dependent on the name they call you. The office they give you or the position they give you in the church and you know in this church as well you'll find that there are many people who are folding their hands in fact they will not do anything they will not rise up and do whatever they can do uh, for the growth of the church and for the glory of God because they grudge the church and their grudges well uh, they didn't choose me to be so and so to be such and such but you know as you study the life and the ministry of Stephen and as you see the grace of God, the gift of God, the power of God within his life, you just see that you ought to dismiss that idea entirely. So that's the first thing I want you to realize, that it doesn't depend upon the position you hold, it depends upon the condition of your heart, your spiritual condition. And you know, another thing is that sometimes we even choose some people. And uh, you, you might be an usher, you might be a member of the choir, you might be a zonal leader, or you might be just an area leader, or just another uh, area of the work in the church you're looking into. And uh, uh, there are people like that who just will do whatever they are told to do, and they will never take any other step. They don't take an initiative. But you know, if Stephen was like that, no miracle will have come out of his hand. If Stephen was like that, uh, he would not have been able to do what he did in the early church. But you know, he did the regular thing, regular responsibility, the distribution of food. Even though that appeared secular, that appeared ordinary. But then we are told that he even manifested the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, spiritual gifts. And many wonders and signs and miracles were wrought through his hand. And uh, as we're studying the Acts of the Apostles, I want you to realize we're not just coming to stuff our head with knowledge. We are coming to study so that our lives will change. And I am believing God that as we are studying these uh, chapters week by week, the everyone's uh, of our lives will change in Jesus' name. Now, uh, let's see in this uh, individual. Today I want to concentrate on spiritual gifts in the life and the ministry of Stephen. And I want you to uh, focus attention on four particular areas. Number one, ministering with the gifts. Then the method of going forth. Then the message of grace. Then manifesting his glory. Simple to remember. Ministering, method, message, manifestation. And first is the gifts. Then the going forth. Then the grace and the glory. You know the church, uh, the church at large is very ignorant about spiritual gifts. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And um, if I were to ask you today, how many gifts there are, spiritual gifts there are? How many ministerial gifts there are? What is the difference between uh, spiritual gifts and ministerial gifts? If I were to ask you, uh, do the gifts manifest in the same way in everyone? Or are there differences in manifestations and operations of the, Holy, of the gifts of the Holy Ghost? You know, many people in the church will not understand because uh, there is gross ignorance about spiritual gifts in the church. And uh, look at that verse 1 again. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I, I would not have you ignorant. We must not be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Now Stephen was chosen because of a number of things in his life. One, 
the character and the charisma. You know, they were looking for men of honest report, men that were really saved, and men that were really living right. That's the character. But then they were looking for men that were full of the Holy Ghost. That's the charisma. He was not chosen just because of, uh, you know, a one-sided development in his Christian life. He was chosen because of the grace and the gifts in his life. The grace manifested in the life he lived. The grace manifested in the change of life. And the gifts manifested in the power of God in his life. Uh, you know, there are spiritual gifts. And then there are fruits of the Spirit. And I want you to realize that uh, there are many people in the church who do not have a balanced idea of what the spiritual gifts are. And they do not understand what the fruits of the Spirit are. And because of that, they are just modeled up in their lives. They are ignorant one of the gifts and they are ignorant also of the fruit. Now, what are the gifts of the Spirit? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with her. Now listen to this, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, this is number two, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, this is number three, faith by the same Spirit. To another, this is number four, the gifts of healing. By the same Spirit. To another, this number five, the working of miracles. To another, this number six, prophecy. To another, number seven, discerning of spirits. To another, number eight, diverse, different, various kinds of tongues, earthly and heavenly. To another, this number nine, the interpretation of tongues. But all these nine spiritual gifts worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Let me talk to you about those spiritual gifts. I've told you that there are nine of them. Three, three, three. That is, they fall into the groups of threes. And it's not in the arrangement over there, you know. If you regroup them, you have the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirit. They deal with knowledge. Those are the gifts that make you to know. They are the revelation gifts. Then you have a prophecy, you have speaking in tongues, and you have interpretation of tongues. Those ones come through your voice. The vocal cords, we call them, uh, you know, the miracles that happen upon your voice. You know, the spirit will just give you the gifts to know something, and then you reveal them as you speak. Then there are the power gifts. Faith, miracle, healing. And you see, these nine spiritual gifts manifested in the New Testament church. And they manifested in the lives of different, different people. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and others in the church. Now I told you that there are spiritual gifts and also ministerial gifts. And um, the spiritual gifts come together in your life to make you the minister you ought to be. And they make you to be able to function as uh, a minister that God is raising you up to be. Now, I cannot teach everything about ministerial and spiritual gifts all in one study. You'll have to come another time if you want to know more. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you won't get everything today, but you'll get enough to set you thinking, to set you praying, and to send you on your knees. And when you come back again, you'll be getting more. Now, there are nine spiritual gifts, as I've told you, but listen to me. Those spiritual gifts may be manifested either in love or out of love. And do you know that when they are manifested out of love, number one, you'll not be able to grow in them. Number two, eventually they'll be withdrawn away from your life because you'll not be able to profit the church. Because they're not given to profit you. They're given to profit the church. And that's why we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, from verse 1, Though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, one of the spiritual gifts, and I'm not charity, love, 
I am become as a sounding, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, one of the spiritual gifts I just made reading to you and understand all mysteries. If I understand all the mysteries, I'm having the gift of wisdom. And all knowledge, that's another gift of knowledge. And though I have all faith, that's another spiritual gift, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, now that's a ministerial gift of helps and mercy. You read that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Do I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and do I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And so you realize that in the church, you want to be useful to the growth of the church and to the glory of God. You need the spiritual gifts and you need the fruit of the Spirit. You need love. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and law and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, you know, all that I'm telling you is, it's not enough to have the gifts of the Spirit. You must also have the fruit of the Spirit. And do you realize that these fruits of the Spirit, well, let me ask you, how many are there? Let's see. Number one, love. Two, joy. Three, peace. Four, long-suffering. Five, gentleness. Six, goodness. Seven, faith. Age, meekness, temperance, number nine. How many spiritual gifts did I tell you about? How many fruit of the Spirit am I telling you about now? Nine. Uh, you see, there are many people who are just after the spiritual gifts. And they do not understand about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, let me tell you in the, Bi in the Bible, in the Word of God, if you have the gift and you don't have the fruit, your ministry cannot continue for a long time and your ministry cannot be a permanent ministry and enduring ministry let me just give you two examples the example of, of uh, Samson in the Old Testament he had the gift of the Spirit the Spirit came upon him and there was mighty power that was upon him but you know he did not have temperance he did not have long suffering he did not have self-control and he did not have love enough Love for God enough to be able to avoid every type of sin. And you know, his ministry was cut short. In fact, we are told he lost the power of God and eventually lost his two eyes and eventually he died prematurely. Can I remind you of, of Solomon? You know, Solomon had uh, some of the gifts of the Spirit in his life because he had wisdom. What that was given to him, not natural wisdom, not just wisdom you get by experience. God gave it to him in a supernatural way. But you know what? He did not have self-control. If his eyes wanted wine, he drank the wine. If his eyes wanted money, riches, gold, whatever it is, he got everything. If his eyes wanted men singers and women singers, there was no self-control. He just got everything. And uh, if his body was telling him that one wife is not enough, he got another wife. If uh, the body said one, another wife is uh, necessary, he got another wife until he was in control of 1,000 women. You know, a man like that did not have self-control. And do you know that his ministry was not permanent? Because, you know, after he died, his son just ruined the whole kingdom. That's what I'm telling you about. It is not difficult to find people that are having the gifts of the Spirit. But they do not balance it up to have both the character and the charisma. Both the grace and the gifts. And they do not have both the purity and the power, the faith and the faithfulness, the courage and the consecration. But you know, if you are going to really be useful to the Lord, it's not enough to just have the gifts of the Spirit in your life. You must also have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And uh, that is what has kept this church to be what it is. And uh, you know, here there is healing, but then there is holiness. Here there is um, deliverance, uh, you know, from sickness, from evil spirits and everything. But then you also understand that there is discipline. 
Because, you know, we discipline our lives. We discipline, you know, the way we do everything. There is orderliness. It's not just miracle, miracle, miracle. Uh, the method is there. The manner is there. Everything we do is according to both the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you understand the difference between a church having the gifts of the fruit and a church that is only rejoicing in, only fasting and praying on miracle alone without the character to back it up. Now, let's come to the life of Stephen in Acts chapter 6. And let's see how he ministered with the gifts in his life. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 10. And they, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now, he ministered with the gifts. Now, as I'm talking about the gifts, I've told you already that, that there are nine spiritual gifts. I do not know yet. I've been praying seriously about when I'll be able to teach this church about the various gifts. And if I'm going to do that, it's going to take me a long time. But then, before I'm able to settle down to do that, listen to me. When we talk about faith, there are various levels of faith. And in fact, the Bible tells you that there are different kinds of faith. Different areas and levels of faith. It's like a ladder. And you are climbing from the bottom part and you are going up. You know, there is saving faith. The faith that you exercise when you are saved, when you are a child of God. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. That's a type of faith. And uh, that is available for everyone. And if you'll call upon the Lord, he'll save you. you. Your life will be changed. And with that saving faith, you get saved. But you know, after you are saved, you realize something. You may be sick. And then you pray and you say, well, I don't understand. Because uh, I don't seem to have any faith. But really, you understand you have faith because you believed that you were saved. But when it comes to praying, to get your prayer through and to get answers in a miraculous way, you are looking for another type of faith. And you may just have a weak faith. And you know, as you're going on in the Lord and, and your understanding of the Bible is increasing, you're going from the weak faith to uh, another kind of faith. Uh, you know, there is the now faith. Now faith is. You know the type of faith that uh, you just pray and you just know before the answer comes that the answer is there already. And then there is a strong faith. There is a great faith. Because Jesus said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. He didn't say he has not found faith in Israel at all. You know, he had found faith in many many people but you know he has not found so great faith no not in israel and then uh, you know you say what is great faith you know that man said speak the word speak the word only and my servant shall be healed that is the person that believes that the word of jesus has such authoritative power that just speaking that word will bring uh, you know will bring the result but then there is still another kind of faith it is called the gift of faith the gift of faith. You know, I was talking to you last Thursday, if you were here, on receiving without asking. Uh, you know, let me ask you this. Uh, suppose you know that uh, they had made an edit, that they were going to throw you into the lion's den. If you prayed, what will you do? Uh, you know, if you have prayed and they come to catch you, and now, you know, the soldiers are marching you on, and they say, now we're going to the lion's den, we're going to the lion's den, what will you do? You will be praying, you'll be shouting, with, uh, you know, at the top of your voice, oh God, rescue me from the lions, rescue me from the lions. <laughs> you know, because you are praying with a weak faith, you are praying with the normal faith, but you know, Daniel, he didn't shout, that's the gift of faith. He just, you know, went there, and he was getting ready in his mind and when he got into that cave he just slept off because he was manifesting the gift of faith and you know the apostles when they caught them and they threw them into the prison and you know if you were you will not be able to sleep in the prison you'll be saying oh god what have i done i've been serving you i've been worshiping you and now they took me and they put me into the prison what shall i do your name will come to shame and they will say look at an apostle in the prison peter didn't do that you know what he did when he got into the prison i'm talking about acts chapter 12 he slept 
and an angel came and woke him up and said uh, Peter you are this not your place let's go out of this place and put on your sandal put on your clothes and he came out of that place and the door opened automatically for him that is faith but a higher kind of faith that is a gift of faith and you remember in the Old Testament they came to take Elisha and they said where is Elisha and the, the servant woke up and he said uh, well what uh, what shall we do my father my father and Elisha said don't worry about it they that are with us are more than they that are with them you know that's different from singing I am not alone I am not alone Jesus is I'm not alone I'm crying and shedding tears that's different you know it's different from uh, you know he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world repeating it seven times and 20 times positive confession that's different you know but uh, when that servant was worried uh, Elisha just said oh Lord open his eyes that he will see what I see you see that's the cooperation of the gifts of the spirit there because he had the word of knowledge he knew they were there he had the sending of spirits you know those uh, heavenly angelic uh, spirits were there he had the gift of faith you know those things were there he had the gift of miracle because when they came to him he just said oh god blindfold them that's the gift of a miracle and they were blind and he said who are you looking for and he was in front of them they said we're looking for elijah he said come on follow me that's authority and they followed him and they followed him to the king and then the king said shall i kill them he said don't kill them he said oh god open their eyes let them know they're in the enemy territory and god opened their eyes he said now you eat and go back to your master don't come again you hear that's a gift of faith so you see that's what i'm talking about there are different kinds of faith and when god gives you the gift of faith the prayer becomes very very simple in a word you just speak a word and it's an authoritative word and so you are told that stephen was full of faith that's the gift of faith and then we're told that he was full of power and he did great wonders and miracles among the people and in verse 10 they were not able to resist the wisdom by and the spirit by which he spake now let me talk to you a little about wisdom there is natural wisdom you know sometimes you find some people uh, they're just born that way and they have that wisdom that whenever you ask them a question uh, because of the talent god has given them the natural ability god has given them they answer intelligently but that's still not the gift of the word of wisdom it's not even spiritual wisdom it's just natural then there is a type of wisdom you get from experience you know you be you are old and uh, you've been dealing with people you've been interacting with people you've been reading the bible for a long long time or you've been discussing with people for a long long time you've been reading christian novels and christian books and you have been a worker in the church for a long time and you remember when this happened 1960 something this is how we handled it when this happened 1970 something this is how we handled it when it happened last year this is how we handled it and you have got experience which is wisdom but you know that's not what we are talking about about the gift of wisdom uh, you know solomon had prayed as i told you and he said oh god what i want is wisdom not natural wisdom that he was born with another kind of wisdom not wisdom that he would have gained from the father the father was a king the father david was a king and you know the father had wisdom and he waged war and he ruled and he did many things not the one he learned from his father but just the wisdom from above and god answered that prayer and do you know that two women had two children one slept on her own child in the morning they started arguing about um, who will who is the owner of this child one said it's mine the other said it's mine and you see those days there was no blood test because medical science had not increased or expanded till this time so they couldn't say okay let's test the the blood of mother a mother b and test the blood of the child and in that way you could know who is uh, really the mother of the child and you know the child was uh, not talking yet the child couldn't say this is mommy and uh, you know uh, that's my mother and so immediately that gift of uh, the word of wisdom manifested and Solomon said bring me a sword and uh, said I'll cut the living child in half to do justice for you give you half give you half the one that is not the mother said oh yes Solomon that's what you do the one that is not the mother said well Solomon don't worry about it give the child to her and Solomon said that is the mother 
you know, that type of wisdom, you don't get that from a school. You may go to seminary, Bible college, and you may read and study for a long time. You don't get that type of wisdom from books. That's what I'm saying. That is spiritual. And that is a special gift that is given. And you know, if, you are, if you're a Christian worker, uh, there is a natural wisdom, the wisdom you get by experience, and then there is a wisdom that comes by a gift coming from God. You remember that Jesus manifested it very many times, very many times in his ministry. They brought a prostitute and he said, well, we've we'll just caught this woman in adultery. Moses said, stone her. What do you say? If he said, stone her, they'll say, well, he's wicked, he's preaching love, he can't stand by it. If he said, don't stone her, they'll say he's opposing Moses, they will, uh, they will persecute him. So he was writing on the ground. Then they, they troubled him, saying, well, what do you say? He said, he that has no sin, let him first cast the first stone. And they went away one by one. He didn't say do it. He didn't say don't do it. He just said, let the perfect person stone the imperfect woman. You see, that's the gift of wisdom. They came another time, shall we uh, give tribute unto Caesar or not? And um, they wanted to catch him. If he said, uh, pay tribute, they'll say, he wants us to be slaves. So the Roman people, if he says, uh, don't pay the tribute, they'll say, well, he's opposing Caesar. And he'll persecute him. So he said, give unto God what belongs to God. And give unto Caesar what belongs unto Caesar. Uh, you see, that is the wisdom we're talking about. And uh, Jesus promised that you do not premeditate what you are going to say, what you are going to, how you are going to answer or respond. But the spirit of your father will speak within you at the needed hour. So then, you understand what I'm saying? That uh, Stephen ministered with the gifts of the spirit. And uh, you'll find that he had a number of the gifts. He had uh, miracles, he had, uh, he had uh, the gift of faith. And no doubt there was the gift of uh, gifts of healing and other gifts in his life. But then he had revelation gifts. Because when he was about to die, he, he saw the heavens open. And when he saw the heavens open, he saw Jesus Christ on the right hand of the Father. You say, what gift is that? That's already getting into the prophetic ministry. Because, you know, in those days, in the Old Testament, they were called a prophet, a seer. Because a prophet was somebody that will see. Sometimes you will, you will see the picture and you'll just say it out. Sometimes you will see the, the writing and you will say it out. Or you'll, saw the, you'll see the vision of the Lord. And, uh, you know, that's how the prophets in those days, that's how they saw. Or sometimes they will hear a word. Because you'll find many of the people said, I heard. Ezekiel said, the hand of the Lord was mighty upon me. And then he said, I heard. So the prophets sometimes will hear. Sometimes they will see. Sometimes they will know. And sometimes it will, it will just be revealed unto them. We're told that Daniel was given visions and dreams. And you know when Stephen was going to die, he saw Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. He had also the revelation gifts. And so Stephen ministered with the gifts of the Spirit. But I've told you that um, it's not only the gifts, he also had the grace of God. Not only the power, he had purity. Not only the faith, he had faithfulness. And not only courage, he had consecration. And uh, you know, the Bible says we should desire spiritual gifts. But if you are ignorant about what the gifts are, if you are ignorant about how to manifest in the gifts, and there is no way you'll be able to even recognize when you're having the gifts. But as I've said, I may be teaching on it later. Now, what's a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is a special attribute given by the Holy Spirit to members of the body of Christ according to God's grace for use within the context of the body. That is, you are to have the spiritual gifts to be useful unto the, into the church. You are not using it so that you can have money. You are not using it so you can build your, uh, you know, your bank account. And I've told you here, don't confuse the spiritual gifts with natural talents. Natural talents are God-given abilities that are distributed to human beings in general, not only to spirit-filled believers in particular. Now, Stephen was also close with humility. And uh, do you know why many people have started in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit? And yet, they have not been able to continue in the manifestation or the operation of those gifts. One reason is because of pride. And uh, I'm telling you all this because 
when you're in a church where the Holy Ghost is moving, the Lord will be using very many people in your house fellowship, in your area, in your zone, in the church at large. And I have had many, many testimonies of how God is using many of our members here. Now, I know that the Spirit of God is working in the whole church. It's not only myself, even though I'm the one that comes here on Thursday to minister. But uh, many of us have the gifts of the Spirit. Some of us recognize them. Some of us may not be recognizing them, even though you have them. And I know that there are people here in this congregation, you have the, the gift of faith, or you have uh, the gift of the working of miracles, or the gifts of healing, or, or the gifts of diverse kinds of tongues, or interpretation, or prophecy, or you know, whatever gift you have. But do you know, if there is no humility, you'll not be able to continue in the manifestation. Uh, you know, every time, and this is part of the secret, every time, every time, I go before the Lord. I don't take God for granted. And I go before the Lord. I pray as if I don't have anything. And I tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm nothing. You are everything. In myself, I can do nothing. You can do everything. And if you leave me alone this Thursday, I will not be able to do anything at all. Now, listen to me. I want you to understand this. Because many people don't understand. When you get into pride in your life, you know the Spirit of God can leave you. And you will not know the Spirit of God has left you. Now, look up at me here. Uh, you know, when you plug a fan into the socket and you switch it on, that fan will begin to rotate. Am I right? And now, uh, the fan will be rotating and rotating and rotating and rotating. But you know, do you know that if you remove it from the socket and you put it up, the fan can still be rotating for the next uh, few seconds or minutes. Am I right? some people are like that when you are humble the gifts of the spirit are there. they are there when you are humble and when you are following the lord the gifts of the spirit are being manifested because you are plugged into the power of god but when pride comes in you are you are not plugged anymore to the power of god but the fan is still rotating and people seeing the rotation of the fan will still think that you are plugged into the power they don't know that now the power is up it's only that you know because you have been rotating and rotating now the movement is still carrying on for the next few days or for the next few hours but you will know it in yourself that you are no more plugged to the power directly so you see that's why it's important to wait upon the lord and that's why it's important to keep humble and every time i come here on thursday i quietly repeat it to the lord oh lord i can't do anything without you i cannot feel anybody i cannot work any miracle i do not have anything i can give to the people only you can help the people and you know when you are humble like that when you are closed with humility you will discover that the gifts of the spirit will continue in your life well i'll be teaching more about that later let's go on we'll see ministry with gifts uh, from Stephen. Now let's see the method of going forth. Verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. Uh, you see, he did not just sit back, he went forth. And this was his method. And if you look at all these references I have uh, quoted here uh, in Acts chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 17, chapter 18, and chapter 19, uh, you'll discover something. Any, anywhere Paul went, he first of all went to the synagogue. Because the synagogues were the, people, were the places where the people were gathering together. They gathered together for many reasons. Either they were searching scriptures, or they were seeking the truth, or they were worshipping according to the religious beliefs of the Jews. But you see, they were gathered together in the synagogues. And because they were gathered together, uh, Paul will always go to them first. It was a strategy to bring the gospel to them. And uh, Stephen here was using that strategy. It was a method of going forth. The method of going forth. Then there arose certain of the synagogue. You know, after Stephen had finished his responsibility, in distributing the material needs of uh, to the congregation then he'll go to the synagogue and when he went to the synagogue he'll be preaching the gospel he'll be he'll be telling those seekers after the truth that jesus christ the truth has come those who are looking for the way jesus the way has come those who are looking for life eternal that jesus in jesus will have that life eternal and we're told that he ministered to different types of people the libertine the libertines and the cyrenians the Alexandrians uh, from Egypt. 
Cilicia and uh, Cilicia and Asia, from Asia Minor. And he spoke to different nationalities, different people in his method of reaching out with the gospel. Now, uh, you know sometimes you say, oh God, uh, give me this, oh God, give me that. Listen to me. If you don't use what you have, at every opportunity that you have, there is no way God will give you what you are looking for. Because God has given you some things in your life already. And while you are folding your hands and you say, well, they have not made me an apostle, they have not made me an evangelist, they have not made me a pastor, they have not made me a teacher, and you are just a grumbling, and you are not using what you have got, there is no way God will be able to give you more. But you know, Stephen, he used what he had. And as he used what he had, God was prospering him more and more. We've seen the ministry with gifts and we've seen his method of going forth. He went to the places where the needs were. And he started uh, distributing not only the bread natural now, but the bread of life unto them. And uh, what was his message? It was a message of grace. We know he was preaching a message of grace because of what the people said. You know, the people were interested in the law of Moses. But he was telling them, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be saved. That's why they said he was opposing the law. He was opposing Moses and he was opposing the holy place. Look at it from verse 11 and see his message of grace. Then the servant, the hired man, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And he stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the Lord. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. You see, the accusation they gave him uh, was the same as the accusation they brought against Jesus Christ. The, some false witnesses said about Jesus, we have heard him saying that he will destroy this temple and he will raise it up in three days. And yet he was speaking about the temple of his own body. He was speaking about the grace of God. He was telling them that uh, he has come to fulfill the law and now it is a time for truth and grace. And it is the same thing that Paul the Apostle was preaching. Come to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 from verse 20. And instru uh, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God to declare his say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. So you see, he was preaching Jesus Christ as Savior. He was talking about the grace of God. He exalted the Jesus of Nazareth above Moses, above the law, and above the temple. And because he was presenting Christ as the hope of Israel, and as God's high priest, and the only way to God the Father, so they accused him that he was speaking against Moses, he was speaking against God, he was speaking against the holy place, and he was speaking against the law. But actually, his message was the message of the grace of God. And so we've seen that he ministered with gifts. We've seen the method of going forth. We've seen the message of grace. Now let's see the manifestation of the glory of God upon him. Manifesting his glory. In Acts chapter 6 verse 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. You know, they were accusing him that he was against Moses. 
And these people knew that Moses had been chosen by God in the Old Testament. And uh, they must have remembered something about the life of Moses and the ministry of Moses. Come with me to Exodus chapter, chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. Reading from verses 29 and 30. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. Of the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mount, Moses wished not, knew not, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. You know what God did? They said, this man was against Moses. And for God wanted to convince them that as Moses was a chosen servant of God, so Stephen was a chosen servant of God. And as they were concentrating on Moses, and they remember that when he got the law, which they said, uh, you know, that he was against, they knew that when he, was go when he got nearer God, and when he also received uh, all the instruction about the building of the tabernacle, the holy place, they saw that his face was shining. And now do you see what God was doing? They accused this man Stephen of going against Moses, going against the law, going against God, and going against the temple. And God just convinced them, or wanted to convince them that as the face of Moses shone, while he went to get the law, while he went to collect uh, instruction about the tabernacle, about the holy place, and while he came near unto God, in the same way the face of um, Stephen was shining, as if it was the face of an angel. God was approving him, and God was approving his message, and God was also approving and confirming the second or the new covenant. The old covenant was passing away, and the new covenant, which uh, Stephen was preaching, was now coming on. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, But if the ministration of death, written and engraving in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So then Stephen was ministering by the ministration of the Spirit. And in verse 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, the Old Testament, how much more does the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory? For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by, the, by reason of the glory that excelled. For if that which is done away was glorious, that's the old, the old covenant, how much more that which remains, the new covenant, is glorious. And so uh, Stephen was talking about the new covenant. And as he talked of the new covenant, then God approved this message and approved this personality of the glory of God upon his, upon his face. And when they saw him, they saw his face shining as the face of an angel. Now tonight, very briefly I've talked to you on some important things on the life of Stephen. The gift, the going forth, the grace, as well as the glory. But you know, I just want to wake you up to the realization that every member of the church ought to see how it will be useful to the lord and the lord is looking for us to be faithful in whatever we in whatever position we may be and stop grudging the church and uh, stop grudging the leaders that well uh, they have not given me the right position the right title i've shown you the life of stephen it's not the position it's the condition of your heart it is not the magnitude of the work it is the faithfulness you manifest in that world and do you know that if you'll just manifest a, a spirit that is humble and that is loving and you'll go on with the Lord, the gifts of uh, the spirit will be manifesting in your life in a small way. Now listen to me as I'm talking about the gifts of the spirit. Uh, you know there are people that um, the Lord is starting way. But you know, they want to start at the, on the top of the ladder. And that's why uh, they do not uh, grow in their lives. But do you know that when God is going to give you the, any gift of the Spirit, 
in the manifestation even though it is a perfect gift it's a wonderful gift in the manifestation it will start in a slow way and uh, you know if you are faithful in that little thing the lord will make you to grow on and on in the use of that gift now you understand that when you first of all have a thing you may not know how to use it properly and it is as you study the word of god that you'll be able to know how to use this uh, the outro and make use of the gift that god is giving you and i've told you that except you keep humble keep humble the gift of the spirit in your life uh, you can even lose those gifts and now i come back on the gifts because uh, many people do not understand and whatever you are given to do in the church now you just move into it and you just get into it and you will see what the lord will be doing now you don't have to wait until you come to the pulpit here to say thus says the lord you know that's what some people are waiting for when they when he'll call them and say well you come and minister on a thursday you come and minister on a sunday but you know there are only 52 sundays in the year and uh, there are so there are so many thousands of us if we're going to be rotating it one by one before it will come to your turn jesus might have come <laughs> do you understand what i'm saying uh, but you know where you are you can manifest the gift of the spirit and now i want to help you to be faithful where you are uh, do you know that samuel had the gift of the spirit in his life but he didn't know because God was raising up that young boy as a prophet. And God called him Samuel, Samuel. And you know, even though he was hearing the voice of God, and the revelation gives what to start in his life, he did not know it was God talking. And he went to Eli, and he said, uh, Sir, my father, you are calling me. And Eli said, I'm not calling you. Go and lie down. And he went to lie down. The gifts were there, but he did not recognize that it was God talking. The voice of God to him as a novice looked like the voice of man. And you know, in the night he had that same voice again, Samuel, Samuel. He might say, well, I went to him before and he said, I'm not the one calling you, so, uh, you know, I'm so sleepy and, uh, you know, I don't want to just go up and down. But he went again, he said, eh, you are calling me. And Eli said, I'm not calling you, go and lie down. You know, that is faithfulness. You know that is humility. You know that is discipline. And if you don't have those things in your life, there is no way you'll be able to recognize and manifest the gifts that a God is bringing up in your life. And he had the voice again. And he went to Eli again. And Eli said, My son, when you hear that voice again, now this is training. You may be having the gifts of the Spirit, but you may not be training how to make use of the gift. And so as Eli was training him that, well, my son, you are going to hear that voice again. When you hear that voice again, you just answer back, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. He didn't know it was a servant of the Lord. It was Eli telling him, now, don't act as a small boy anymore. You are now a servant of God. And when you hear that voice, this is what to say. Uh, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And he heard the voice again. And you know, just as a beginner, you are not going to be able to manifest it perfectly at the beginning. You know, he didn't say, speak, Lord. He said, speak. He forgot the word, Lord, for thy servant here. That's a beginner. And then the Lord spoke to him. And if you've read about the life of Samson, you'll, be, you'll see in Judges, don't open I'll just tell you, Judges chapter 13, where told the Spirit of the Lord began to move him in the camp of Dan. You see, little by little, that spirit of God was moving him. But you know, he had no helper. He had no counselor. He had nobody to train him up. And so, you know, he just developed the gifts the way he knew best. And uh, he didn't last. He just ruined his life. But you know, when you are in the church, listen to the Lord. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now, listen to me. Some people feel that it's only when you are manifesting the opportunity or the privilege of preaching that you can manifest the gifts of the spirit but uh, let me just show you some examples of the way you manifest the gifts of the spirit in what people call ordinary times in exodus chapter 31 i'm reading from verse 1 and the lord spake unto moses saying see i have called by name Bazaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah, and have filled him with the Spirit of God. You hear that? I have filled him with the Spirit 
of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning words and to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting stones. Think about that. The gift of the Spirit for cutting stones. And you know, they were to build the tabernacle. And uh, uh, they, they, I told you, uh, science and technology had not developed. And how they were to cut the stones, how they were to melt the gold, how they were to make, they were to do all the things that they were to do, they didn't know. And God filled a particular man with the Spirit of God. Now, it wasn't to preach, but then be faithful. God may give you a supernatural wisdom, the gift of the word of wisdom on a particular area of the world, and it may just be, it may just be an, what you call an ordinary thing, and you may not recognize it, and if you don't develop it in that, there is no way you can grow up in your ministry and become a preacher later. Therefore, when God is, has filled you with the Spirit in wisdom, in faith, in knowledge, or in any other area of the area of the work, just do it, and you'll find that the Lord himself the Lord himself will be making you to grow up in other areas of your life. Now, come on to 2 Kings. Chapter 6. Second Kings, chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight, too narrow, too small for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thy every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. This is not preaching. This is just going to the forest to cut wood and to make a, a building. And you say, can the gift of the, of the Spirit of God be used in such a place? Now look at it. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. And as one was felling a beam, the axe, um, the axe said, fell into the water. And he cried, at last, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, where, where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he caught himself he cut down a stick and cast it in hither and the iron did swing therefore said he take it up to thee and put uh, and he put out his hand and he took it what is that that's the gift of faith and the gift of the working of miracle just a manual labor on the side of the sea but you know, many people are waiting uh, for a preaching opportunity to be called an evangelist, to be called a preacher, to be called a, an apostle before they make use of the gift. Turn with me to Second Corinthians. Uh, sorry, Second Kings. Second Kings. I'm reading from chapter three. Jehoshaphat said, "Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him?" One of the king, one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the, unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father. And to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord has called these three kings together uh, to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. Now, verse 15. But now, but now, Bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord was upon him. Uh, you know, many people do not know that, uh, you know, when you are in music or singing, that uh, you can also pray and have the gifts of the Spirit in your life. And you say, Well, I'm not the preacher after all. 
I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not praying for the sick, and I'm not doing anything at all that is spiritual. All I do is, uh, you know, playing violin or playing trumpet or just singing. Uh, but you know, Elisha uh, said, "Well, uh, I will minister, but you know, it's not ordinary like that." Now you get me a minstrel, a minstrel that can play, a minstrel that can sing, that has the spirit of God upon her, that is manifesting the gift of the spirit when she's singing or when she's playing. And they brought, they knew somebody like that who had a confirmed ministry of singing and of playing. And while that uh, minstrel was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he got for Samuel chapter 16. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player upon an harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Verse 22, And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. He was not a member of the prayer warriors, no. He wasn't, you know, fasting and praying and calling on God and, you know, shouting at the top of his voice. Oh, no. That spirit was so violent upon his soul. And everybody recognized the evil spirit had come. They knew because his face will change. His countenance will change. They knew that the evil spirit has come upon him now. And they went to call and they said, the spirit has come upon him. The spirit has come upon him. Please uh, come and start playing. And David took his arm and he played on his hand. He didn't pray. He didn't shout. He didn't, he didn't uh, specialize in demonology. He played with his son, so Saul was refreshed. And Saul was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Uh, you see, that is music, but it's playing the music or singing the song with, the, with spiritual gifts. And you know, many people do not realize that every area of the church work can be done with the gifts of the Spirit. They say, well, I don't need all the gifts of the Spirit because, after all, I'm not a preacher. I'm just an usher. Can I tell you something? There was a day that uh, somebody was coming into this, uh, into this church. And uh, that man was brought in a taxi. It was the wife that, uh, it was the wife that uh, brought the man. And as, uh, as they came down, the man could not walk because the man had strolled. You have to support that man uh, to be able to even uh, to be able to walk. You have to, you know, he has to lean upon you. And so the woman, a sister, just came down from the taxi and told an usher sister, and then and said, "A sister, please help me uh, pull my husband out." Just an usher, right in front there. You know what? The sister usher said, "Don't pull her down. Let her walk." And the woman said, you don't understand. Uh, he is paralyzed. He has a stroke. And uh, he cannot walk. So help me. So both of us can carry him into the church. The sister Usher said, I understand what you are saying. Let him walk. And uh, the woman explained again. The usher said, no. I understand what you are saying. Get out of the way. And the sister just said, uh, uh, got the door open and said, excuse me, sir. Come down. You can walk. And the man came down and walked. That's the gift of the spirit, but she is just an usher, and she is not a member of the prayer warriors. But you know, many people do not understand. They feel that only when I'm preaching. That's why I said I'm still going to spend time to talk to you on the gifts of the spirit. Do you think that will be all right? But already you have learned something tonight. You have learned that wherever you are walking, an usher, a member of the choir, or you are walking on the building, the gifts of the Spirit can be manifesting in your life. And if we are all manifesting the gifts of the Spirit, it's on the ushers, it's on the choir, it's on the congregation, it's on the preacher. You know, whenever we come here, miracles be happening everywhere. Rise up and let us pray. You know, Stephen didn't uh, grudge or didn't grumble on the position he held. He just went on cheerfully, lovingly, wholeheartedly and faithfully manifesting the gift of God upon his life. How about you? How about you? House fellowship leader, area leader, zona leader, usher, member of the choir, those who are working with the, ch with the children, working in the maternity, anywhere you are working. The gifts of the Spirit are so necessary and essential. 
in the building up of the church, in the growth of the church, and for the glory of God. And remember when the gifts begin to manifest, 